Welcome to the uh, Hot Gas uh, APC webinar this morning. My name is Bob McElvain and I'll be your uh, host this morning. We encourage comments as we um, move along. I'll be making a presentation. Peter Spinney, uh, formerly of GE, now a consultant, will be. Uh, we're going to follow up with a rather extensive uh, analysis by Stuart Nicholson of Primex. And along the way, we encourage uh, comments, but uh, uh, Scott Affelt, I'm sure, is going to have some things to say. Uh, Todd Malik, um, John Miranda, Jeff Denigris, and Fred Washburn have all in contributed uh, information that shows up uh, in these PowerPoints that I'm going to be presenting. So I would encourage them to uh, join in with comments as we go along. And, don't hesitate even to uh, interrupt me in mid-sentence because uh, we do think that the discussion aspect of this is going to be very important. So we believe that this webinar is going to be more than just a, uh, a hot gas uh, market and analysis. And in many ways, it's going to be a template for how we proceed on all combust flow and, and treat uh, analyses and, and decisions. We're saying that this webinar will be a template for leveraging IIoT and remote O&M for, for the system component and consumable suppliers. And we've coined the term the industrial internet of wisdom, which is, uh, I think, a way of elevating what subject matter expertise needs to be applied and how it's gonna be applied and the organized manner in which it needs to be applied. And uh, IIOW utilizes the data analytics provided by the IIoT and then provides the interconnection between end users, suppliers, and subject matter experts to create the total cost of ownerships and more importantly, create new products with lower TCOs. Uh, Scott Affelt and I were just talking for a minute or two before we started, and he pointed out that they're working on data analytics for providing a virtual subject matter uh, expertise. And uh, we were also opining that this could be a step side of process that the subject matter expert uh, becomes empowered by the new and latest tool to virtually analyze the, the decisions and uh, he becomes more knowledgeable, and so the tool itself then be, can, can become better. So the uh, internet interconnections, we believe, need to be as prolific in IOW as IIoT. And there is an, a need for subject matter ultra experts uh, and decision systems. And the subject matter ultra expert is also a term that we've coined, but we do believe that the subject matter expert needs to be a part of continuing decision systems that make him more expert and help the people he's dealing with make the decisions. So this webinar will provide examples of both. It is all part of the following interconnections. So supplier personnel in each group and geography are internet interconnecting with peers around each of the thousand large purchasers of combust flow and treat products. And when a, a company like BASF is making its decisions centrally out of Germany, uh, you need a lot of interconnection uh, among all your uh, product groups in order to effectively take advantage of that. The owner operator uh, personnel in each plant and in each role interconnecting around processes and products used in more than one plant. Uh, we do have a site for Berkshire Hathaway Energy, for instance, that has information on all their 200 plants, so you can look at what's going on in filtration uh, activity at each plant. So user control groups that are expanding scope to create decision systems and through digital technologies become international. We're working with some of the officers of the Dry Scrubber Users Group and others and seeing how uh, we could all work together to help create some international organization that help make better dry scrubber decisions. And then you've got supplier uh, control groups that uh, 
can be focused on total cost of ownership studies and proposing one question, can the hydrate users group, which four of the big lime companies are conducting, can it become an uh, international hydrates decision group? And then the creation of subject matter uh, ultra experts. So again, these <clears throat> tomorrow's experts will have to master the massive TCO data generated from IIoT. So the SMUE will therefore need to be very focused and to continually utilize and help direct the decision systems around his specialty. Suppliers of high performance products with the lowest TCO uh, products will benefit from the SMUE validation of their claims. So we're gonna be presenting uh, some pretty good examples, I, I think here of the SMUEs and what they're accomplishing. But because of all this, the large hot gas system suppliers face a market sea change. And of course, a lot of that is driven by changes in the geographical markets. Companies such as BMW, GE, Alstom, and MHPS, Long King, and Doosan have the knowledge and resources to navigate the sea change in the hot gas APC market and to greatly increase profits. However, those who fail to adjust are likely to lose market share. Niche players and suppliers of components also must navigate a new market route. Uh, this is a risky business. I'm not really going to get into to, uh, all, all the, some of these details here because we have so many things going on. So, um, uh, but there is going to be a big increase in the market opportunity due to IIoT and remote O and M. And we believe, for instance, that in the power industry alone, it could add 20 billion a year for hot gas uh, system uh, O&M and remote monitoring and uh, somewhat smaller amounts in uh, cement, 3.7 billion uh, in refining, 363 million pulp and paper, 600 and some, and steel would be a big one with uh, over 2.4 billion. So just in the hot gas section of the market, this could be a substantial increase. So, so, so uh, the US, Europe, and Japan, and the OECD countries have now retrofitted air pollution control equipment on most of the big stacks. China's done the same thing. But the bottom line is here, there's a big new uh, market in Asia and other developing uh, countries. The, in, in the future, expenditures to operate and maintain systems will exceed the expenditures for new systems. So in China, you know, the US, Europe, and so forth, operating those existing systems offers a huge market. And this ratio will increase over time as all hot gas operations are fitted with air pollution control systems. So today we'll be talking uh, a little bit uh, in Stuart's uh, presentation about the accomplishments he's made at NACE, but they're definitely benefit, uh, demonstrating the benefits of IIoT and remote O&M for hot gas uh, filtration. Uh, both plants have uh, dry systems. The successes were, fo were the focus of speeches and discussions at the recent DSUA conference. A third party, which is Stuart, so Primex specializing in dry scrubber technology, continuously monitors the systems and can su suggest changes at any time. There are weekly meetings with the plant staff to discuss not only remedies to problems, but ways to improve the systems. Uh, this has resulted in some amazing things like patented bag cap designs, which are licensed back to the bag suppliers. It has resulted in improved valve maintenance procedures and provides the details for valve suppliers to improve their designs. Savings can be measured in millions of dollars a year. So the big potential of IIoT and, and remote O&M is to facilitate improvements, not just avoid problems. The myriad of continuous total cost of ownership analyses provided by the process management system is not directly actionable. There is a need for a new breed of subject matter experts. We will call them subject matter ultra experts who will be much more focused on a very narrow niche and then continually analyze the massive information being generated. So 
I won't go into this slide uh, either, but we analyzed the potential for these five uh, five companies that do have uh, a lot of opportunities here, how they, they stack up, and uh, some of them have lots of experience, but uh, uh, not necessarily the IIoT skills yet. Uh, others, uh, Long King specifically, has lots of short-term experience, and that provides a lot of leverage for them. And I believe uh, Long King is on the call with us uh, today. So we looked at the, the those rankings only apply to the power industry. When you get into pulp and paper and some of these other areas, you have uh, uh, where Andrews is a leader. And GEA is a leader in smelting and, and FLS and, and cement and so forth. So this is these 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 leading positions are only for uh, the power industry. So what we're basically doing here is comparing. If you look at many of our uh, webinars on IIoT, you know they, we all start with a data, information, knowledge, and wisdom, and we're essentially saying that you need that same quantity of um, organization points when you're dealing with IIOW. And the cost uh, of sensors is falling, and this is a, a tremendous opportunity uh, to take advantage of IIoT for, for hot gas uh, activities, whether it's dry scrubbers, wet scrubbers, precipitators, or any of the other uh, pollution, NOx control, mercury, and so forth. Uh, wisdom comes from many decision groups in which the broadest incorporates the most narrow, but one broad group connects with another. So filter media for hot gas interconnects with filter media for gas turbine air inlets. And there are going to be substantial third-party uh, revenues, which we've pretty much just gone over uh, otherwise. And uh, now I'd like to get into some uh, examples. Uh, Todd Mellick is with us here, and he's pointing out that uh, in addition to what we're familiar with, their primary airflow measurements, uh, they're um, also doing some things with dry scrubbers. Uh, Scott, would you like to spend just a uh, uh, Todd? Would you like to spend just a minute or two on flow measurement for dry scrubber modules? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. I sure can. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, I mean this. First slide here, you know, talks about uh, primary airflow measurement at you know at lignite plants that we've you know did years ago, but more recently, um, and what got my attention for this webinar, um, you know, is we're supplying gas flow measurement for uh, for dry scrubbers at uh, at Omaha, and the idea is you know they've got six uh, individual scrubber modules. Um, you know, most of these dry scrubbers uh, and even the wet scrubbers, um, <clears throat> you know, they they do not have flow measurement to the individual scrubbers. So, you know, the OEMs used some CFD, uh, you know, years ago and have made the assumption that the uh, the flow measurement to the individual modules is close enough type thing. Um, but we've been working, you know, with Nebraska here, and uh, we've we've just we we went through a demo. I mean, again, this is like all the, you know, this is the flue gas from the boiler, so it's got all the particulate ash, everything in it. And you know, they wanted a demo to prove that that our sensors could uh, handle such a, uh, you know, a nasty environment there. Um, so that was successful. We've now supplied uh, the flow measurement for for all the six individual ducts. And uh, they'll be getting that installed over the next, uh, you know, couple of months. And uh, so we just, you know, see the opportunity to uh, to hopefully, uh, you know, branch this out into uh, a lot of, of ex other existing dry scrubbers. Uh, most of the wet scrubbers, you know, they don't have the smaller individual modules uh, that I've seen uh, that, you know, would apply more for the for the dry scrubbers. So. But this could up, could apply then also to uh, uh, fabric filter modules or precipitator modules or sure uh, yep. others as well. I mean, our our strength is is gas flow measurement of hot, dusty applications. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we do crazy things like tertiary air at uh, cement plants. Uh, we measure the off gas from electric arc furnaces. So, it's a very you know robust technology. 
Yeah, very, uh, very useful. And again, the, the more sophisticated we get with these control systems and remote monitoring, the, the more you, you need uh, components such as this. Any uh, other questions for Todd before we move on? So the auxiliary air dampers and the control of those dampers is important as well. And I don't know that we uh, are going to spend any uh, a considerable amount of time on this, but uh, if uh, someone from Rotork would want to make a comment, uh, this would be the appropriate time. But again, the actuators and the dampers uh, and the drives for those dampers become a very important part of the um, total cost of operation. I don't believe we have anybody from Thermal on, uh, but we did cover this TRS monitor in detail a few weeks ago in our pulp and paper webinar. But I did just want to point out that the uh, that all these SEM systems measuring all these uh, gases can be uh, linked uh, for process measurement as well as for uh, uh, the uh, emissions um, uh, Part 75 control requirements. Uh, I did, we again in the pulp and paper we had a uh, fairly extensive discussion of automatic uh, controllers for nozzles. Uh, this is beyond probably what's needed here, but uh, John Moranti, are you? Uh, on with us this morning. But in any case here, the uh, per performance of these nozzles becomes critical. And you, of course, in dry scrubbers, you've got the two, uh, two uh, fluid flow uh, nozzles as opposed to the atomizer. But where you, where you do have the two fluid flow, the, the measurement of parameters around those nozzles becomes critical. So, the uh, we had put up a, uh, uh, a Malvern slide because they're involved in, in these hot gas systems where you've got the uh, wastewater uh, and, and water related things that they have optimization for flocculation processes. But um, Malvern also is uh, involved in the um, measurement of particles, and I think that's another uh, critical point. So uh, I'd like to turn the uh, uh, slide over, uh, uh, the rostrum over now uh, to uh, to them to make some comments. So uh, Jeff, would you like to ma uh, make some comments? Sure, Bob, can you hear me? I sure can. Uh, you might speak, might speak just a little bit louder. Yeah, sure, I'll just get closer. But hey, thanks for... Uh Thanks for inviting me on this and to uh, to include both of those slides. Uh, yeah, you're you're coming in a little faint, so anything you can do to come in a little bit stronger. Is this better? Yes, yeah, better. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Take you off a speakerphone there. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that you're inviting me on here and, and sharing this information with the group. As far as Malvern Instruments is concerned, uh, you know we've we've been at this for quite some time. IIoT and, and the IIOW is is a refreshing way to uh, introduce the ability to uh, to provide real time information and uh, real time control. Um, and and in the two presentation slides that you just had something on water treatment, that's something fairly new for us. Um, but we have been involved with uh, dry sorbent injection uh, plants, as well as the various materials that get used, whether it's uh, lime or trona or sodium bicarb or, um, or activated carbon. All of those have a critical aspect to them, and it's surface area, and in, in like, it's particle size. So in order to improve the efficiency of those materials and the effectiveness of those materials, um, particle size really is critical. Now, whether or not it's, um, it's justifiable to put a, an online system on there, um, you, you do have cases where material is of granular form and it's being uh, processed at the plant. Uh, the plants can certainly take that information in real time and not only monitor those milling systems, but uh, optimize them. So 
the yield that you're getting at the end of the day is the particle size distribution that you want uh, at the highest uh, at the highest yield possible. So that transfers to the most efficient use of those materials as well. Um, we've done this in a number of different uh, facilities and, and again in a number of different uh, projects. The slide that you see in front of you now is showing a picture of an image of an Incitec, which is a laser diffraction-based particle size analyzer, uh, and is taking real-time measurements of that particle distribution as the material passes by. Um, the, the most important thing about that is it does communicate out, uh, whether it's 4 to 20s or whether it's Modbus uh, or, or OPC servers, as we use now, uh, to a DCS system. So those those decisions <clears throat> uh, can be part of the SOP of the instrument. Um, so not only is it analyzing and monitoring the size, people can see what those size uh, distributions are over time. You know, there can be and are um, critical processes that are controlled based on those, those measurements. Um, cement, as you mentioned before, is probably one of the longest uh, users of this type of technology where these instruments are, are controlling the air classifier uh, on, the, on the finished mill systems. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, we're providing that information, we're providing that, uh, that link back to the control system so that they can, uh, they can make those changes. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep on going if, uh, if that's fine. Sure. So, Looking at some of the data that is here, um, again, as I mentioned, uh, on-site milling of sorbents was, uh, was a real um, uh, important part of, uh, of our introduction into this field and in power, um, power plants in general. But it's not the only one. Um, we are involved in, down in Mississippi, Mississippi Power with, uh, with the, coal fire, uh, the, the, the pulverized coal lines. Um, and each one of those does have an Incitec system on it. Uh, and again, the Incitec is providing real-time information. So the classifiers on those mills can speed up or slow down depending on what the output of the material is. Um, so regardless of, uh, uh, of the hardness of the material today versus how it was last week, uh, or um, the, uh, the condition of the mill itself, uh, those things change over time. So we're measuring what the output is, we're measuring what the particle size distribution is, and if it does change, uh, we, can, we can bring that signal back and, uh, and adjust the process to maintain particle size uh, as it is critical to many of these processes. Yeah, I think that's very uh, useful information and does highlight how effective the IIoT and remote O&M and SMUEs can be because you're providing, empowering them with all sorts of this particle size information, uh, and then that analytics that Scott is producing is going to give you additional information that uh, can take advantage of, uh, of, of, of what you're measuring, et cetera. So uh, I, I think these um, instrument-related uh, slides that we've been uh, discussing here are quite important, and it's not only the cost of sensors, sensors going down, it's the ability of sensors to provide unique uh, data that is going to make this so, so powerful. And I think you've done a good job of, of, of uh, summing up the improved management and making better decisions and so forth here, so thanks. Uh, we uh, have several people from uh, Crane on, and they're welcome to make some uh, any, any uh, uh, comments that they'd like to make, but um, you know, part of all of this is, as you have these decision systems and guides, is to interconnect with the blocks that are being generated in a lot of these areas and maybe working with the blog uh, composers to uh, provide additional insights. So Crane has, uh, relative to slurry valves, such as they are used in the lime slurry uh, injection for spray dryers. Uh, they have a blog that makes some some uh, comments relative to the uh, slurry valves and what uh, what you need to do uh, um, in order to design the right uh, slurry valve for the uh, process. Uh, one of their other people, Jake Spence, is has a blog 
that on the pumps and includes uh, the slurry pump considerations. Uh, we've happened to done a deep dive on slurry pumps for dredging and mining and uh, and are aware of all the, the number of parameters that uh, that can be ad adjusted to give you a better TCO. You can make the impellers bigger and, and more expensive, but with less wear and and then in the, in the dredging, they're getting up to three inch thick casings. So uh, the casings don't wear out as as often. So anyway, this I think are two uh, useful examples of these blogs. Uh, did anybody from Crane want to have an insight here or anything before we move on? If not, um, uh, did, I, yeah, I heard a little bit of noise there. Did somebody, if somebody has anything, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, inter interject here. Uh, so, so the DSUA meeting was an eye opener for me, uh, and I could see the uh, power of the knowledge that resided in that group. And the, uh, but for example, the U.S. Dry Forks decision on CDS was made based on a large installation in China. A Long King is is one of the major, if not the largest, supplier of dry server systems in the world. But the U.S. has an equally big advantage in that uh, it is a leader in IIoT. And so that um, DSUA can use IIoT uh, in unique ways. And that, uh, th that is something that we are, are pursuing, as I uh, really, as I said before. And uh, so... There are all these different opportunities. Operating uh, companies can set up joint ventures and operate and maintain facilities around the world. Uh, so if you're a power operator or even a, a Coke plant operator, we've even suggested to one of them, why not be operating Coke plants around the world? So with every valve, pump, burner, and filter being monitored, these companies can generate substantial international revenues. Uh, but this also applies to all the suppliers of nozzles, limes, filter bags, SEMs, etc. And superior knowledge about the processes is necessary to proceed. And this knowledge can be cultivated by becoming uh, truly international. And a lot of these user groups tend to be U.S. focused or uh, U.K. focused or so, or European focused or, or whatever. And uh, but you do need these dry scrubber uh, ultra experts, and they need to be very, very focused. And right now we have uh, a situation in the United States of uh, a number of people that have been uh, laid off as the coal-fired power industry is shrinking. And these are individuals whose expertise could be well utilized around the world. And these systems need to utilize the four A's, which are alerts, answers, analysis, and advancement. Uh, we've been providing those in some very narrow areas, such as uh, coal-fired power plant air pollution control, and we've been doing it for uh, 40 years. But uh, you, do, you do, need, do need to have uh, the alerts. You need to have answers, which on an organized basis, you need decision groups and other ways to uh, provide analysis. And, of course, you need the advancement or the training. And the SMUEs uh, would emerge and continually gain knowledge from their participation in the decision group activities. Uh, we have, for instance, the dry scrubbing uh, uh, website and knowledge system that's part of the coal-fired power plants. So there's maybe 10 or 15 of these sub systems that are all part of coal-fired power plant decisions. And these decision guides need to get into all these different things from the regulations to uh, all the uh, cost of ownership studies and whether you can use DSI along with dry, uh, spray drying and so forth. Just even some simple things like rules of thumb without having to calculate, uh, or in many cases you don't even know, but uh, if you, how much lime, you're, lime or limestone you're going to need. But having some sort of a starting point, the technology comparisons, and Finding out about new technology and how to adapt it, uh, the, the catalytic filter, 
with DSI uh, can get 90% removal of NOx, SO2, and dust all in one uh, device. And there are several hundred of them in operation. So obviously, it is potentially a new uh, way to do things. And then methodically analyzing things like uh, when you're capturing uh, uh, SO2 with bag filters and a cake, uh, you probably don't want to use the, what in accounting terms is the LIFO, which is uh, last in, first out, because you what you want is the uh, first in particles that abs absorb the sulfur to be the ones that go out. So you need to, to take the FIFO uh, route, and that's just one example there. So these, uh, uh, are there any questions at this point before we move on? Get out of this then. We'll go on to the next one. Uh, Bob? Yeah. Uh, this is Peter Spinney. Uh, not so much a question. Uh, this has been really a, a helpful overview. Uh, it, I was thinking, putting together the, the presentation uh, that I'm going to do and, 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 and looking at where the industry is. Um, I, you know, this has been sort of the focus here is hot gases, and but there's so many broader issues that apply not just to hot gases, but, but the whole process. And as some of the discussion uh, thus far today has, has indicated, I was thinking maybe a, a follow-on webinar that talks about the broader issues of, um, you know, how do you how do you capture data? How do you extract information from data? How do you get knowledge from that inf information? And how you incorporate that into work processes and, 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 and automate what can be automated? And it was just a thought I had listening to some of the discussion earlier. No, I think that uh, is very good. And just for a little bit of background, uh, Peter uh, uh, participated. We did nine hours of uh, webinars for uh, Pacific Corp. Uh, on solving their NOx control problems and avoiding a $700 million SCR. And Peter made a, uh, one or more very good presentations on using neural networks and combustion op optimization. So what we showed in that, in that whole set of nine hours, it's a holistic process that was, uh, uh, will, will enable them to avoid the SCR. So it, it does include everything from operating that boiler to ultimate efficiency using neural networks, possibly uh, using um, uh, some of the particulate monitoring uh, at, the, uh, at the pulverizers and all these different, uh, different things. So yeah, yeah you, may, you wanna, may wanna comment a little bit more because we are gonna have Peter uh, making a presentation after I just finish this for a minute or two. Um, the interconnection yeah. of the organizations uh, is highly complex, but the inter Internet of Things is highly complex. It's got all, you know, jillions of different components. But when you kind of start mapping this out, you start with process uh, uh, subject matter ultra experts through process management control, you know, dry scrubbers, systems. Then you get down and if you want to go directly through the fabric filter, bags, media, you know, and fibers. Or you've got spray dryers, then you've got all the flow of fans, pumps, and, and, and valves, and so forth. So you've got all these different players and all these different things that need to be uh, determined. And so, so what we, we just did is to uh, put the names of some of the people that are participating here uh, and where they belong in uh, this uh, schematic here, this overview. And then we're pointing out that what you really need, for instance, is a slurry pump uh, decision group because the dredging and the mining have a lot of the same uh, problems that you're going to have in your wet FGD slurries, you're going to have in your dry FGD, and so forth. And the same thing on the, on the valves. And then the hot gas measurement and control, uh, as was pointed out, applies to, to many things from the cement, cement kills and others. It's not just air pollution control systems. And uh, Ivonic is on the uh, webinar with us this morning, and they make a unique high temperature fiber. And really, they should be part of, uh, of 
C6 through C8, which is everything from how, how do, where do you use high temperature fibers throughout industry, uh, how do they fit best into hot gas filter media, and then how are they incorporated in the bags. And in the case of uh, Ivonic, it may be that their fiber uh, allows you to put in a laminate that uh, is better at removing the SO2. And if that's, case, if that's the case, it affects the media, but it also affects the uh, bag design and the cleaning rate and all these different uh, things. So um, you need uh, lots of interaction of particularly focused as MUEs and decision groups. Um, so is that, is that um, any questions on that before we move on to uh, Peter, uh, Peter's uh, presentation? So, so then we will move on to Peter's and then uh, the, the remainder of the uh, session today uh, is going to be taken up by uh, Stuart Nicholson. So um, at this, this this point, we will uh, though turn uh, to Peter Spinney. And uh, but for for those of you that are um, anybody that's concerned about time and things here, this probably is going to uh, end up being a, uh, a ninety minute webinar totally before we're finished. So we still have another thirty or forty minutes to go here. Um. Thanks, Bob. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to be here. Uh, and I can say uh, on the time issue, I'm uh, time constrained myself. Uh, I'm going to keep this to a basically about a 15 minute high level uh, overview. Uh, I'm uh, I'll say a little bit about um, my uh, current perspective. I, I was a founder of NUCO employee number one almost 20 years ago. Uh, it was a, a great uh, experience. We were acquired by GE uh, about two years ago. Uh, that was a great ride and a great experience. Uh, I think uh, you know GE takes Nuco's technology very seriously. There's lots of opportunities uh, to use that technology and apply it more broadly. Uh, personally, I became a little bit uh, frustrated by the narrow focus, the need to generate next quarter's revenue, and I'm really interested, based on not only the Nuco experience, but my background as an energy economist focused on electric power, power generation in particular, uh, to look at these broader issues that we've been talking about today and to look at um, what are uh, the business objectives, what are the technical challenges, what are the available technologies, and how do those available technologies not only get adopted but integrated into work processes and physical processes in a way that uh, meets the objectives uh, that adheres to the constraints and deals with the trade-offs uh, between them. Uh, so I'm uh, in the uh, with the focus on hot gases uh, it's a natural for me to focus on the two uh, applications that uh, NUCO has and continues to to uh, develop and focus on and provide benefits with, uh, which is combustion optimization and for coal-fired plants, simpler optimization. I, I think we all understand the, the 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 changes that have gone on and are going on in the power industry, shrinking work, workforce, uh, still remaining large uncertainties in in emissions regulation. Uh, we have some regulations that have been uh, you know that, that that are in place. How are they going to be enforced? What is the next uh, administration, whatever whoever that happens to be, going to do? Uh, and um, you know the the uh, uh, how do you deal with uh, the integration of large amounts of renewables? Uh, but coal is going to remain important, as we all know. Uh, the uh, competition in one form or another, whether it's organized markets uh, uh, or, or, or de facto competition, uh, is, is, is virtually uh, everywhere. Uh, we have these old gauging units that were designed for baseload operations. They're now cycling up and down, looking for faster and faster ramp rates, lower and lower night turndown, and all, all, all at, at the same time, uh, ever tightening uh, emissions regulations. Uh, so, uh, you know, and we all understand the, the different uh, types of fossil steam fired boiler designs, pulverized coal being probably uh, the, the biggest, the most widespread, uh, CFPs being a, a newer technology that has some advantages with 
uh, uh, due to lower temperatures, inherently lower NOx, much greater fuel flexibility, um, stokers, and uh, a newer technology integrated gas fed uh, CCTs. Uh, and uh, optimization uh, and extracting knowledge, uh, taking use of that knowledge and, and using it to uh, meet performance objectives applies to all uh, of, of these uh, boiler designs. Uh, so what are the opportunities for uh, improving performance with respect to heat rate, efficiency, uh, and emissions? Uh, with the boiler, uh, we've got performance monitoring that's been around for a long time. Uh, we see a lot of systems that are underutilized that have become shelfware, uh, but nonetheless, there's a lot of information available through those systems. And uh, the, the challenge is making use of that knowledge, uh, again, uh, integrating it with the work processes so that it actually manifests in better uh, plant performance, higher reliability. Uh, boiler tuning. Um, boiler tuning is important, and uh, you know this is a human expert coming in who knows how to get the boiler to behave how it needs to behave through manual adjustments, through changing uh, DCS curves. Um, that's a one-time process. Those results begin to degrade uh, over time as soon as the tuner leaves. Uh, one of the things that uh, the closed loop optimization that uh, NUCO and now GE has done uh, and others is uh, to maintain that state of tune and adapt as conditions change, as the boiler becomes dirtier, uh, as fuel quality changes, uh, et cetera. Uh, with uh, the the increased, uh, you know, with the the increased uh, adoption uh, and requirements to use air quality control systems, uh, whether it's dry scrubbers, wet scrubbers, SCRs, SNCRs, uh, that uh, greatly uh, greatly uh, it makes the, the the entire process much more complicated. Uh, at the same time, there's more need for optimization and more need to coordinate uh, to coordinate uh, combustion. Uh, boiler uh, controls and, and, and the back end systems required for the emissions control. Uh, with the turbine, there's substantial benefits available through uh, the, the performance monitoring that I mentioned uh, and things like sliding pressure uh, throttle control, basically uh, taking a, 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 a instead of uh, uh, in, in, instead of just constricting steam flow uh, at, at, at less than uh, full load, actually uh, producing less steam with the attendant efficiency gains. And finally, the balance of plant, cooling towers, condensers, uh, uh, controlling outlet water temperature, et cetera. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities for improving performance. And uh, there, as, as we've already heard today, uh, there's an increasing availability of uh, of, of, of instruments that are capable of capturing relevant measurements and, and dealing with the harsh environment they have to operate in, and that creates great opportunities for systems that extract the knowledge from that data and apply it back uh, toward the plant's operating objectives. Um, uh, I guess, uh, can you advance the slide? Uh, I've gone on to call quality is important. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, it's advanced. Yeah. Okay. yeah so yeah, uh, coal quality, as we all know, has a big impact on combustion, has a big impact on, on efficiency, has a big impact on uh, maintenance issues. Uh, uh, and, and even, uh, you know, we've got uh, Coals ranging from you know anthracite on one end to peat on the other, with bituminous, subbituminous, lignite in between, uh, in terms of heat content. But even within each of these uh, categories, there's a great amount of variation uh, with with respect to the to the relevant coal uh, properties, ash content, uh, grindability. Uh, Ash fusion temperature was a, a big issue in coal-fired plants. Uh, has a, has uh, a big effect on, on slagging and and how to uh, meet uh, emissions objectives while, while avoiding slagging conditions. Uh, ERB coal in the U.S. has been really uh, the dominant uh, emissions compliance strategy for SO2 uh, and 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 uh, and NOx. Uh, it creates a lot of issues, particularly for uh, plants that were designed for bituminous coal. 
Uh, and in general, boilers that are burning off design fuels, um, they have a lot of challenges and that creates opportunities for inductive technologies that, again, extract knowledge from the data and apply it back into plant operations without having to make assumptions about uh, design or fuel quality that's not measured in uh, real time. Uh, we're seeing uh, in the U.S. a, a, a fairly substantial uh, wave of uh, uh, conversions where pulverized coal plants are being converted to natural gas uh, to meet emissions compliances, compliance largely in anticipation, I think, of the CO2 regulations. That may have slowed down a little bit in the last couple of years, but uh, there's still quite a few gas conversions going on. Uh, and, and it's important to note that uh, uh, the optimization, uh, the type of optimization I'm talking about, combustion optimization, applies equally uh, to uh, gas-fired uh, combustion. When, when I was with NUCO, some of the earliest projects uh, were with uh, gas uh, and, and, and gas oil-fired uh, uh, plants, and the, uh, uh, the benefits in terms of both uh, NOx and, and heat rate were, were substantial. They were, in fact, greater than, than, than we were able to achieve uh, on pulverized coal units. So what is boiler optimization? Optimization is a term that's broadly used, uh, but in terms of what uh, NUCO uh, has done, uh, and now GE is continuing, uh, it's applying artificial intelligence optimization in real time uh, for a closed loop application that's integrated with the distributed control system that uh, integrates both um, uh, the combustion and boiler cleanliness for coal, the soot blowing, uh, and it's essentially taking your best operator on their best day and, and having that level, or maybe somewhat beyond that, uh, 24 by 7, 365 days a year. Uh, again, it's integrated directly in the distributed control system. It's a closed loop application, uh, but it's not doing direct control. It's essentially substituting uh, for an operator, uh, what an operator might do with the 40 to 60 biases available through the DCS, but finding that whatever combination of biases uh, every minute or so that best satisfies uh, the objectives of maximizing efficiency, controlling uh, uh, emissions, and adhering to safety constraints. Uh, there's a tremendous ability uh, to apply uh, analytics based on uh, this data being available and this ability to model the data. Uh, I think the the, the surface, the, the you know, the. the the surface has only been scratched in terms of taking advantage uh, of the data that we use for closed loop control uh, and, and, and extracting the information using predictive analytics to uh, predict failures to, uh, and, and I, I think uh, I'm very excited about this next phase of uh, online analytics and what it can provide both from uh, uh, an efficiency uh, and, and, and reliability uh, standpoint. Uh, the boiler optimization technology that NUCO, now GE, uses use a combination of model predictive control, uh, online learning neural networks, uh, heuristics or rules, first principles uh, to uh, basically address these problems. Uh, and, and, and it's important that uh, for uh, this type of optimization that the tools are available to apply the right methodologies to the right aspects of the problem. Uh, so, you know, what are the benefits? This is just a, an illustrative uh, calculation for a 400 megawatt unit firing PRB at an 80% capacity factor. Um, and this is taking into account the uh, uh, avoided lost revenue from the inspections required in the U.S. under the, the, the MATS Mercury regulations. Uh, but uh, that, uh, there's an availability benefit, uh, a substantial one. A big part of that is through um, optimal soot blowing through not cleaning clean surfaces by minimizing unnecessary soot blowing and the uh, uh, corrosion, erosion, and tube leak outages as it come with that. Uh, the availability benefit is a substantial um, improved heat rate um, and, and NOx reduction value. In this case, the assumption is the unit has an SCR and that $26,000 a year is uh, avoided ammonia costs. And um, so we see here, this is 
you know, again, for 400 megawatt unit, one unit, we're looking at uh, a, a, an annual benefit of, uh, of, of $1.5 million without taking into account any monetized CO2 benefits. Uh, now, there's already a monetized CO2 benefit uh, in California, in Reggie, and there's movement afoot at the state level to consolidate some of those into a larger market. So we may see a, a more widespread uh, CO2 uh, uh, benefit for optimization. So the, the typical benefits for, for combustion optimization, 10 to 15 percent reduction in NOx, uh, half to three quarters of percent uh, heat rate improvement as a function of boiler efficiency, uh, controlling CO to whatever the desired limit is, might be 50 ppm, uh, 100, 250. Uh, better ramping and load following, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, most of these plants were designed for base load operation. They're now ramping up and down uh, and being able to uh, do that and, and avoid the degradation in performance and efficiency and emissions uh, that, that, that comes with, low, with, with ramping uh, it, it is a big benefit and a very large benefit that, that a lot of uh, uh, GE NUCO customers are, are beginning to experience is using this technology to achieve uh, lower minimum load. So uh, plants that are operating in an organized market uh, where uh, they need to be on all the time, but where the, the value of of, uh, of, of megawatts is quite low at two in the morning, uh, they're sitting there losing money and the, the, the lower you can get in load and maintain flame stability uh, and, and meet other constraints, uh, that, that, that's a large dollar savings. Uh, and then again, in case, this is more case specific, but better controlling opacity, uh, avoiding the types of things where an operator sees a spike in CO, they, jack up O2, uh, then the CO goes away because it was wet coal and the O2 stays jacked up, uh, other instances like that. And being able to do all of this while adhering to uh, uh, fan, mill, and other equipment limits and doing that automatically. And there's a lot of uh, insights and, and, and what I call situational awareness that, uh, is, that comes through uh, the use of this technology, whether it's from operators, engineers, plant management, et cetera. So this is just a, 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 an, a, an example, uh, relatively early combustion uh, optimization, uh, where this is a 600 megawatt Riley turbo unit uh, firing PRB. And on the left, you see uh, uh, just uh, four of the uh, controllable parameters that are optimized. And uh, without an optimizer, uh, you see they're more or less on the left. Uh, basically, uh, operators are going to leave leave things alone unless there's an issue. They might ramp up. Uh, they might make an ID fan bias if they notice an imbalance. They might uh, turn O2 up. They might forget to turn it down. Uh, but more or less, they, things stay the same. Where with uh, the combustion optimizer uh, operating online, uh, it's continually moving within constraints, taking small steps. Uh, each of these and the other 20 to 30 manipulated variables in a way that, again, best meets the objectives of maximizing efficiency, uh, minimizing NOx, keeping it to a limit, and keeping uh, CO under control while dealing with other equipment constraints uh, as well. And so what, what results from this is, this is just a scatter plot that's showing boiler efficiency uh, and, and, and NOx um, on, the, on the left. And uh, with, in, in the unoptimized condition with the, the, the plot above it, and uh, with the optimizer making these small moves with the, the, you know, the whatever, the 20, 40, 60 manipulated variables, you see then efficiency is clustered uh, at the high end and NOx clustered uh, at the low end uh, where, where you want both to be. Next slide. Uh, this is that same unit, and the point here, uh, this is five years later, coming out of a, 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 an annual maintenance outage, and I uh, can't see the labels here, but basically, uh, at this point in time, the unit had been up and running, it reached normal operating conditions, and, and, uh, 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 and, and, you, and you see it was actually, uh, you see that it's improving. Uh, it's improving boiler efficiency as soon as it's turned back on. You see it ramping up there, and that's that half to one percent efficiency benefit that is typically uh, achieved with combustion optimization. Next slide. 
so we're talking about hot gases here. Well, um, better control over gas temperatures is uh, one of the ways through which these benefits are achieved. Uh, this is looking at average uh, exit gas temperature uh, with the optimizer uh, turned on uh, versus off. You can see the distribution is tighter. The average is lower, and that's simply less unnecessary uh, heated air leaving the stack being used instead uh, to generate electricity and improve efficiency. Next slide. Uh, so, uh, SIP blowing, the, this is a newer technology. Uh, there are intelligent SIP blowing systems that have been uh, around for quite some time. They, they provide lots of benefits. Uh, what, what NUCO and now GE have done is, is uh, use a, a SIP blowing optimization system that's integrated with the combustion optimization system, and it's using a combination of first principles of, of rules about which uh, zones need to be cleaner and which don't under given operating conditions for a given set of objectives and uh, using neural network models to select the blowers within each of those zones uh, that best achieves the improved cleanliness. And this is just a, an example. Uh, it's, this is a, a typical SIP blower uh, HMI. Uh, the uh, SIDOPT master has been added to that HMI. And uh, there's a, a lot of benefits here. There's another uh, three quarters of a percent heat rate, and more importantly, uh, a fairly dramatic reduction in uh, unfor in uh, forced outages from tube leak. Next slide. Uh, this was just a uh, a look at uh, what. Uh, SOOTOPT can do incrementally, uh, and, and this is a plant, it's a 600 megawatt unit, uh, and I'll point out that these uh, th these particular results uh, are, are have been presented at numerous conferences, they're in the public domain, uh, but you can see at this point in time, uh, basically this is, uh, NUCO, now GE, has a, a, an annual maintenance and support program, and part of that program is looking at performance and tweaking the system to get the best performance. And this is a point in time where just some changes were made to SIDOPS rules. Maybe might have taken an hour or two moving a mouse around, uh, clicking, a, making a few clicks, changing the rules. And you see this, uh, when, when the new rules went into place, you see this incremental NOx reduction going from about you know 0.21 down to about 0.18. And that's been maintained ever since those changes uh, were made. If we go to the next slide, Looking at that same uh, period of time, we see that, uh, again, when those rule changes were applied, we see steam temperatures uh, improving steadily, getting, uh, in fact, closer to the 1,000 F set point than this plant had ever achieved since they went to the Lonox firing system. And that is uh, an issue that's worth noting. Uh, for most of these plants, uh, when, when they've gone to low NOx burners, they've added over fire air, uh, particularly for T-fired units, achieving um, steam temperatures uh, is, is very challenging while meeting the NOx constraints and uh, what the combination of combustion optimization uh, to optimal tilts and, and optimal uh, boiler cleanliness management were able to basically uh, get back to the 1,000, 1,005F seam temperature and meet NOx and, and, and overcoming what's been a major trade-off. Next slide. Uh, again, over the same period of time, we see uh, this uh, substantial improvement in the heat loss index, which is essentially uh, the components of heat rate that are affected by uh, boiler optimization. And we see we're getting about another half percent improvement on top of the one percent that had been achieved in the in the year that the uh, since the system was first installed. Next slide. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, gas uh, inlet temperatures, we're talking about hot gases here. Well, the better you can control uh, the, uh, your gas inlet temperatures, uh, the, the better your efficiency. Um, and there's some substantial uh, reliability gains uh, also. So this is, basically a, uh, this is basically a frequency distribution looking at gas inlet temperatures um, uh, without the optimizer, uh, with the optimizer turned on, we see uh, most of the time uh, we're much closer to the set point, and more importantly, we're avoiding these high temperatures on the outlier, on, on, on these high temperatures that uh, you know cause uh, damage to air baskets and 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 some other uh, negative effects on equipment health. Next slide. 
so SCRs, SNCRs, you know, in the U.S., uh, uh, virtually all remaining coal plants are going to have one or the other. That's the case in, in, in much of Europe as well, and increasingly uh, in, in, in developing uh, nations. Uh, basically, uh, the same optimization I've just described, instead of uh, focusing on st uh, stack NOx is focusing on minimizing uh, reagent uh, basically by uh, getting to the required removal level with less ammonia you then have um, uh, you can go longer uh, in your, uh, between uh, catalyst replacement intervals you're able to avoid ammonia slip uh, reducing ammonia bisulfate uh, and sulfur trioxide deposits. Uh, for those units that have uh, these so-called blue plume opacity excursions, those uh, were, were basically by getting to the NOx reduction with less ammonia, uh, those problems uh, typically go away. Uh, and uh, with uh, tighter condition-based gas temperature control, uh, we're able to get the most out of both uh, the SCR and SNCRs, which uh, are particularly sensitive to both temperature and CO. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is uh, just a, an example of a 600 megawatt unit, again firing PRB, uh, where the optimizer was turned on uh, right here, and it's manipulating all of these uh, all of these uh, biases here, and you see basically uh, the uh, NOx uh, going down. They, 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 this was NOx at the SCR inlet, and we get a corresponding reduction in the ammonia required to meet. Uh, to, 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 to meet the NOx uh, limit. Next slide. Uh, and this is basically that same unit over a year, and we're looking here at uh, basically SCR ammonia flow uh, as a function of load. And over that year, uh, on the left, this was uh, these were all of the times when the uh, optimizer was not enabled. And on the right, these are the times when, when the boiler optimizer was enabled. You see uh, it's a much tighter distribution with the uh, reduced average that, that we talked about in the last slide. Next. Uh, this is just an example of a, a distributed control system screen uh, that basically uh, provides access to uh, the, the optimizer for the operators. Uh, it has the look and feel of the other screens for whatever distributed control system is in place. Uh, you're able to enable or disable individual manipulated variables and you get a high level overview of uh, major operating parameters, NOx, CO, O2, uh, et cetera. Next slide. Uh, so just not going to go into this in detail, and every time I look at it, I end up adding arrows, and I've never seen fit to take one away. Uh, but what we're dealing with here, this is showing uh, on the left the uh, the things we can't control, uh, ambient temperature, fuel quality, barometric pressure, uh, water inlet water temperature, megawatt demands, ramp rate. Uh, the things we can control, uh, you know, the combustion, uh, Injection rates, uh, airflow, air distribution, uh, slip blowing, boiler cleanliness, temperature controls, and the combined effect of those on the relevant process states, stoichiometry, heat transfer, steam temperatures, uh, temperation sprays, uh, that those effects on process performance, uh, emissions, CO, NOx, et cetera, heat rate, ash deposition, uh, carbon and ash slagging, erosion, corrosion, thermal stress and how those come together to affect uh, the costs of operation and revenues in the case of avoided uh, outage. So uh, I don't think anyone's ever going to be able to come up with a closed loop optimizer that explicitly addresses uh, all of these interconnections and all of these processes. But what we can say from 20 years of experience is by optimizing combustion and optimizing boiler cleanliness, we can basically uh, create conditions that improve uh, all of these process states, the associated performance parameters, and the, the costs that, uh, and revenues that determine uh, financial performance and profitability. And um, that's it. Yeah, that's very, uh, very interesting. Are there questions uh, that people have here? Uh, Scott Affold, you know, we're a lot on data analytics here. Did you want to make any comments there? Yeah, um, this is Scott Affett with Exemplar Energy. And uh, Peter, uh, that was a very good presentation. And uh, I wish you luck in your uh, new, uh, your, your future endeavors there uh, on your own. Um, one comment, really, and, and Peter kind of touched on this a bit. And uh, clearly, combustion 
is influencing kind of the back end. Uh, we're talking about scrubbers, for example. Uh, one area that I see is a possibility for some opportunities to apply analytics and advanced controls is to look at holistically optimizing all of the uh, components of the uh, air pollution control train. So uh, P Peter kind of pointed out the impacts of combustion on uh, exit gas and on NOx levels, which has uh, impact on the SCR. But I think the next level of optimization in the application of analytics is to is to look at each of the uh, pollution control trains. So the scrubber, the precipitator, the SCR, and combustion, and, and look at optimizing all of those as an integrated system. Right now I see each one of them is being optimized independently, and, and there could be some uh, incremental opportunity to for improvement in terms of performance or reliability uh, by optimizing all of them more holistically. I completely agree with you, Scott, and and uh, it's really uh, I think that's really the the net, you know doing doing that and doing it across units, plants, uh, across a fleet. Uh, those are sort of the the the, the big uh, opportunities on, on the immediate horizon. And I'd actually I have to run to a meeting, but I'd I'd love to have a follow up conversation with you, Scott, to talk right, well, about you, these in a little bit more depth. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, you, you've got my, uh, I think you've got my contact information, but let's definitely connect. I'd be interested to talk more about this. Great. And uh, thanks so much, Bob. And I'm um, sorry to have to bow out, but thanks for the opportunity. Thank you for the presentation. Peter. Okay. And we'll now move on to Stuart Nicholson, uh, and we've got uh, his presentation teed up here. So, Stuart, the uh, floor is yours. I see him online, but um, I don't see him as being uh, logged into the audio portion. So I don't know if Stuart needs to get logged into the audio. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, – yeah, let's see. Um, let's it says you're not connected to the audio, uh, Stuart, if you can hear me. Yeah, I wonder if I need, I need just to send him a message there, so maybe we have, maybe you better open this up. and. Yeah, um, I can send him a chat message and see if it... Uh, yeah, that probably would be good. I think Stuart has a very... Uh, powerful uh, message to deliver and uh, he he was uh, very uh, much involved in from it says he's on, on the phone line uh, George, can, is your uh, audio um, button set for mute or can you hear we still can't hear you you still can't uh, still can't hear hmm. uh. There's a, a red button towards the top by the uh, control panel. I don't know if uh, it's showing muted or not. Or want me to, want me to op open that up? Uh, uh, um, he's talking to me by oh, chat. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. It, uh, it should be towards the control panel, just to the left of the control panel. There's a circular button with a uh, phone symbol on it. Wow, he's uh, getting set here. Primex is acting as what we call a subject matter ultra expert for several of the NACE plants, including uh, Logan and Carney's Point. And at the DSUA conference, uh, there were presenters from both those utilities, uh, Stuart uh, and some of his people made presentations. But the bottom line was that with the remote monitoring, the IIoT and the uh, weekly and, and uh, monthly uh, analysis is by Primex that uh, there have been major changes and everything from the valves to the bags to the whole process of uh, operating these dry scrubber systems. And one thing about these dry scrubber systems is you, you save a lot of money by not having a water pollution problem. But you've got a pretty dicey um, set point for your temperatures and your slurry and so forth. You have to inject slurry in enough quantities 
to remove the SO2. On the other hand, you're limited by um, the dew point and the, the fact that if you put too much slurry uh, into, the, um, into the duct, you're going to get uh, caking on your bags. And then also with this potential humid uh, atmosphere in your ducts and in your dry scrubber, you have the potential for corrosion. So this, uh, the dry scrubbing with either the spray dryers or circulating fluid beds has its own operating uh, unique characteristics. And as we saw during the show, whether it's the slurry valves for the lime slurry, whether it's the bags, whether it's a lot of the other components that are involved here, there are unique um, challenges and so that you really need a process subject matter expert uh, as well as, as subject matter experts possibly on the valves, the pumps, and all these different things. But the process itself of dry, of dry scrubbing is unique. And I, I think that's where Stuart and his group have, uh, have uh, stood out is that they're, they're operating with awesome systems, with B&W systems, and systems by some of the other suppliers of the dry scrubbing. So, uh, any progress there, Ross? On uh, yeah, we're communicating right now. Um, I almost got them in. Okay. And so this was a uh, a, a two day meeting, and the dry scrubbers. I I, I think you could say that uh, Stuart uh, was a helped found that dry scrubber meeting. He was the first the president was on the board for five years or so. Uh, there's a, a new group coming in to take uh, the positions because it's a, it's a election time. Uh, the outgoing uh, president uh, uh, was with a Coke manufacturing facility that has nine dry scrubber systems. Uh, you've got people from American Electric Power on that board, uh, Duramar, who does the corrosion uh, uh, linings and so forth. So you have a mix of uh, people, but you do have a number of uh, power plants uh, involved. I think this year, as well as the last couple of years, um, Joe Wang of Long King has also been in, present at uh, those meetings and he gave a, a presentation uh, this year. And- uh, I think he's on now. Uh, okay. Okay. Stuart, hello. I... hello. Yeah, we can hear you. I think now, Stuart. Okay, can you hear me? Sure, can. We're all set for you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. No problem. Sorry about that. No, we we in fact uh, give us a chance to provide some compliments for you. So you you're going to have to live up to them now. Well, I I heard it all. Thank you very <laughs> okay. much for that shining introduction. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, well stretched out. <laughs> Okay, well, um, sorry for the delay, folks. Uh, and again, Bob, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I will jump right into this. I know we're probably all thinking about the lunch hour, so um, I've got a few things to talk about here. Um, and if, Bob, I'm just gonna ask you to go from slide to slide, so if you would go to the next slide, please, we'll, we'll move right into this. So um, this, this presentation um, was, is basically a sort of a distilled concentrated version of something that was presented to um, a, a bunch of senior executives at Power Plant Management Services, North American Energy Services, and NRG a couple of weeks back at a conference in Charlotte. The subject matter was, um, you know, how technology can transform asset management in power generation. So Primex um, is a company that specializes, is known for specializing in dry scrubber and scrubber performance optimization. Um, as Bob said, I guess we, we would be regarded as subject matter experts in that area. Um, all of, although over the past couple of years, we've been spending a lot of time and, and money in developing the ability to deploy that expertise in a much more efficient way using uh, IIoT and IIOW and so forth. So this really talks about some of the macro issues that drive the need for better means of deploying expertise through fleets of power uh, generating assets. Um, and 
Primex has a product called Performance Assurance Services, which really is the, um, the meeting of real-time data access, um, expertise, and facilitation of action at the plant level to realize the benefit of um, that expertise. So uh, if you go on to the next slide, we're going to first of all talk uh, about ener energy industry challenges. Uh, so the two main, or main challenges that the energy industry is facing right now are, at least in my view, uncertain asset utilization and uh, what I would call expertise exodus. In the, <clears throat> in the first case, uh, we're on slide three now, I think, Bob. Uh, yeah, I, I'm looking at that slide. Maybe yours is taking a minute to get to there. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I'll just speak to that slide three, which uh, shows the frog trying to get down the, the, the throat there. Um, uncer uncertain asset utilization. So there's really four major factors that are uh, driving difficulty in deciding how to resource assets in the power industry going forward. Uh, the first thing is uh, w when we think about you know coal versus gas, the, the, the gas price and the, the price of that as a commodity is really driving the distribution of capacity between those two types of assets. Um, secondly, political and regulatory issues of course are changing constantly. Um, economic, you know, what is the what is the demand for power going to look like in two months from now, two years, five years from now? Uh, how is technology affecting uh, asset choices, asset uh, and capacity factors, and of course, you know, weather, uh, overall demand for power. The the second major issue that's affecting um, decisions that these executives are making is the fact that expertise is leaving uh, the industry or changing, especially in coal-fired industry, uh, as Peter talked about earlier, uh, shrinking of the industry and so forth is causing kind of an exodus and change there. So let's just talk, uh, to, if you would go to the next slide, please, Bob, the, uh, one of these factors, which is gas pricing and how it uh, creates uncertainty in asset utilization. Uh, so this chart shows um, essentially the EIA forecast. Now this isn't very old. This this uh, this is the the uh, annual EIA forecast that came out in January of this year, um, and it shows a very simple chart that says that gas prices forecast to increase over the next five or six years, um, and as a direct consequence of that anticipated increase in gas pricing, we're looking at a, a split, a divergence between coal and gas generation which shows that as that price increases, gas fire generation is expected to decrease, and to fill that gap, coal fire generation is expected to increase. And of course, if we could really depend on these forecasts, you know, asset managers could decide how to deploy their resources, their capital resources, their human resources, and so forth. But if you go to the next slide, Bob, the, <clears throat> the truth of the matter is that those forecasts are not realistic, or at least they're not certain. Um, if you look into the uncertainty of the gas pricing alone, the futures, uh, just the, you know, the one standard deviation of the futures indicates that the gas price uh, is, could increase by 20% next year over today's prices, or it could go down by 30% next year. So it's actually a little bit weighted to the downside. But you know, if you go to the next slide, Bob, that uncertainty in the gas price tells us that all of the forecasts with respect to capacities in gas versus coal are really of no particular value. So we, with that uncertainty in asset utilization, the asset managers, the people who really decide how to deploy resources have a very difficult challenge. They have to be able to move resources between their gas-fired assets and their coal-fired assets with much more, I would say, mobility, much, much, much faster, much easier than they have in the past. So uh, and moving on then to the next slide, back to the uh, other factor that's driving the need for technology changes. Um, I want to talk about expertise exodus for a minute. So looking um, at uh, slide eight, in fact, this shows the a uh, chart that uh, Xcel Energy presented at last year's uh, Electric Power Conference in New Orleans. This shows um, the tremendous uh, uh, gap that is forming due to retirements. Just So just one aspect of, of the exodus is the retirements. So in this example, uh, you know, Xcel analyzed their, uh, essentially their process expertise group, 
you know, represented by the engineers in that community and discovered that more than half of all of their expertise is contained in the minds of people who have 20 or more years of experience and that within the next couple of years, nearly all of those people will be gone. And the pipeline simply is not adequately filled behind them. So there's a, there's a lot of young folks in the industry, uh, but the amount of expertise that they own, in other words, the man years of expertise in folks that have zero to five years is only 100 years of experience in the XL organization compared to you know 450 years and those who have 20 years or more. So this shows that as those folks with all that experience retire, it can't be effectively replaced because of the, uh, the gap, in essence, between those people who have very little experience and those who are retiring that have almost all of it. So that's just one example. Um, if, you, if you go on to the next slide, Bob. The <clears throat> just talking about the expertise exodus, again, not, not just retirement, but a lot of forced uh, layoffs due to the reduction in capacity of coal-fired. Um, a lot of folks are voluntarily leaving because they're sort of seeing the writing on the wall, or at least they believe that, you know, their prospects, you know, folks who are in their 30s and 40s are looking at, you know, they need a career that's going to span not just a couple more years, but another 10 or 15 years. So they're jumping ship voluntarily, going over to gas-fired plants or into other industries. So if we think about this kind of from a top down, what does it mean at the plant level? Uh, the challenges in the industry are driving challenges in the coal-fired fleet, reduced capacity, reduced, uh, you know, uh, pricing on the megawatts. Uh, this is driving revenue way down. You know, a lot of clients who might have been at 90% capacity factors five years ago are now running in, you know, 25, 30% capacity factors. Uh, as Peter said, you know, cycling low and transient loads are uh, adding to the challenge. It's a technical challenge in how to operate plants in ways that they weren't originally designed for. Um, and then at the facility level, uh, the personnel turnover, this is the expertise loss. Some of it's forced, some of it's voluntary. Um, and, you know, uh, compounded with those technical issues uh, due to low and transient load conditions. So all of these things drive into immediate consequences, not just in, you know, cost, operating costs, but, you know, directly in terms of safety uh, and reliability. Next slide, please. So what, what exactly, that's the problem, what, how, how can we go about solving that? Uh, the next slide is just sort of a, you know, a mess of data. Um, what we want to do is, is sort of now turn the whole thing over and look at it from the bottom up. So an operating power plant is producing um, gigabytes of information on a daily basis. You know, there are hundreds if not thousands of instruments that are measuring temperatures, flows, densities, et cetera. Um, how do you get from that haystack of data down to, you know, the needle of meaningful, actionable information? So if you would go then uh, to slide 11, Bob. So performance assurance is really one of the solutions for that. Um, we start with real-time data access. So Primex has direct access into uh, our clients' uh, data historians. These are typically the OSI soft buy servers. Um, so we have, we, can, we have visibility of the data that is being produced by their data historian systems. That data can be interpreted using the subject matter expertise that we've developed over our years in the industry. From that interpretation, we can identify opportunities to improve, whether it's safety, uh, reliability, or efficiency. Um, but that's not where this, this stops. And I think a, a lot of discussion around IIoT stops when the, uh, the opportunity is identified, as if that's where the value in this process is created. We sort of have a different view of that. Identifying a problem or identifying an opportunity is really just the beginning of a process that needs to take place. The next step is to, I guess, understand the value of that opportunity. In other words, some prognosis needs to be applied to understand how important it is, how does it rank in terms of safety, how does it rank in terms of reliability, efficiency, how does it compare with other opportunities that the plant personnel are facing. And, and therefore, what action needs to be recommended and what, how important are those actions? So once 
an opportunity is identified, we then recommend actions. We prioritize those actions and we help actually get them done. And that's another big, I think, sort of uh, misunderstanding uh, in, the, in the business, which is it's not enough just to prescribe an action. It's not enough to identify an opportunity. That action needs to be completed for any value to be generated. So part of what we do is not just the expertise part, but it's the facilitation part. So that's essentially what performance assurance is. It's that full loop. It's a loop that we go around continuously on a weekly basis. We're interpreting the data to assess what I would call critical system parameters, things that could affect safety, for example, really you know, focusing on stability of reagent preparation systems and so forth. Uh, we're providing what we call first layer diagnosis and troubleshooting. So if we see an issue in the data that uh, is, it, it points to a, a safety, for, for example, we're seeing a, you know, an exothermic slaking process beginning to go unstable, we're immediately notifying the plant personnel. We are diagnosing that to see if we can identify the probable cause or maybe the top two or three prob probable causes. And then we're assisting the plant to narrow that down to find the actual cause and to address it. Then on a monthly basis, we're wrapping together all of the information that's been acquired over the month. We're generating key performance indicators, so a high-level dashboard view of what the system is doing, where the opportunities lie. Uh, and we're recommending actions on a monthly basis, and we are performing uh, what I would call facilitation work to make sure that those actions get done to help the people in the field uh, get the resources that they need to uh, go forward with those actions. And then on a, on a broader basis, we're meeting with plant managers and so forth on a quarterly basis. This is an on-site team meeting. This is more of a brainstorming session to look at what was achieved in the course of the quarter and what can be achieved in the next quarter to improve safety, uh, reliability, or efficiency. Okay, so how can this be used? And this is sort of the more macro view. If you could go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> In 2012, as I said, the expertise uh, could be carved into three areas, I think. There's operational expertise, there's maintenance expertise, and there is process expertise. And in 2012, when everybody was operating in, you know, the sort of 80 to 90 percent capacity factor, all of that expertise was really contained within the plant environment. So an individual plant would have folks who've been working there for 10 or 15 years. Uh, operators themselves had become process experts, or they understood a great deal about how their specific unit operated. Uh, they'd acquired knowledge about, you know, whether it was a dry scrubber or a wet scrubber or an SCR or an SNCR or wall-fired or tangential-fired. Those folks who were operating those plants back in 2012 really had a deep understanding. And I would say a lot of the process expertise was owned by operations and maintenance personnel. In addition, of course, there were fully staffed engineering departments at these facilities. Uh, so they had a lot of that process expertise as well. You know, skip forward to 2017, that same plant is operating at a 30% capacity factor. 20% of the, of the operations and maintenance staff have been laid off or left, and 80% of the engineering staff have been laid off or gone. So this is a, this is a, a huge change for these facilities. Most of the process expertise has, has left. So what Primex is doing, and if you would click one more, please, uh, Bob, what Primex is doing is essentially helping the plant fill that gap by providing the, uh, the expertise in specific uh, operational components of the facility. Uh, we are expanding that as, as we speak. But in the, in the beginning part, we're filling in those gaps where the process expertise has been forced out or left out or left voluntarily. If you click one more time, uh, going into 2018, and this is happening now, these facilities are able now to, by decoupling, essentially decoupling the process expertise from the operations or the maintenance expertise, the asset managers are able to deploy those assets more efficiently. So by having folks who specialize in operations but who are not expected to fully understand the process, in other words, taking away the process expertise and putting it somewhere else, 
putting folks who fully understand operations, who fully understand maintenance, but letting the process experts advise them allows assets to allows the resources to be spread out between facilities. So in this example, and this is going on right now between Logan and Carney's Point, they're sharing uh, operations personnel, they're sharing maintenance personnel, and they're even sharing some of the engineering assets. So by essentially decoupling the process expertise from the operations and maintenance expertise, you can now basically share resources in a more effective way. Click one more time. Going forward into you know, the next couple of years, um, in fact, the, uh, because of the asset utilization uncertainty, the asset managers don't know which of these three plants is gonna be operating next year. Is it coal-fired plant A, coal-fired plant B, or is it their gas-fired plant C? So they're now looking at ways to distribute those operational and maintenance resources. Uh, again, once they have decoupled the process expertise from the operating expertise, then they can move those assets from plant to plant more efficiently. So it basically gives a tool to allow the asset managers to deploy all of their assets to the places where they are needed in an uncertain market. Okay, so what are the key aspects of performance assurance? Uh, expert knowledge, of course. Um, we're providing that expert knowledge in places where it's needed, when it's needed. We're providing the facilitation. Again, it's not just about identifying the opportunities. It's about helping the, the people at the plant implement the changes that will realize the benefits of knowing what's going on. Security is absolutely key. Data security, making sure that we have the layers of security that uh, ensure that the data is only shared with the people who need to know it. Uh, intrusion detection, other means to make sure that the data is, is uh, solid and secure. And then finally, it's a fl very flexible and scalable solution so that performance assurance can be provided amongst multiple facilities with similar technologies, and it can be turned on and turned off as that asset is being utilized. Okay, so let's try and wrap it up then. If you go to the next slide, please, Bob. The main benefits of performance assurance, um, well, first of all, safety early warning of potential safety and reliability issues. Uh, with real-time data access, we are able to identify very efficiently uh, deviations from what we might consider to be best practices or safe practices in critical equipment components. Um, we're sharing that information with the plant personnel, both the operations and the maintenance personnel. So they, those folks who are new to these facilities, the younger folks, are getting the, the benefit of our expertise and that's giving them something to, <laughs> to learn and to take forward with them. We need to show value, so it's also about sustaining optimum performance, you know, getting there and keeping it there and reducing cost. So at the end of the day, we're giving these uh, plants an ability to uh, increase their asset value, uh, and in this market, of course, that's critical. Okay. Moving on and talking about what, what presently is happening and what we think the future looks like in uh, IIoT and where this product is going, and I think where the industry needs to go. Uh, performance assurance, uh, this is slide 15, Bob. Performance assurance, <clears throat> Primex presently provides what we call the weekly, monthly, quarterly model. Uh, we're focusing right now entirely on scrubbers. Uh, if you click one more time, Bob, we're going to be we're in the process of recruiting the boiler optimization expertise. We have the data access to a number of these facilities. So in 2018, we expect to be able to offer a very similar set of um, skills and <coughs> performance assurance services on the boiler part of it. Again, we're trying to expand, uh, go to the more holistic uh, approach that Scott was talking about earlier. Um, to include not just scrubbers, but boilers and other balance of plant systems. Um, and then in 2018, 2019, one more click, please. Um, we're bringing this to, to more of what I would call a real-time uh, service, so that instead of just weekly updates, weekly reviews, uh, we're putting in the systems now that will develop hourly, uh, daily and hourly 
uh, reporting information to the folks at the plant level. So that'll be coming next year. Um, and then finally, uh, one more click in 2019-2020 range. Uh, we are talking to folks who are operating the uh, combined cycle units, um, mostly about balance of plant systems, not so much about the combustion turbine side of it, but on the Hertzig operation and main, uh, Hertzig operation and optimization um, and other balance of plant systems. So we do uh, expect, again, working with our existing clients who have all of these types of assets uh, operating um, to, to, to try and uh, assist them with the deployment, decoupling of the process expertise, and then more efficient deployment of their resources. So that's really my story. Um, it's about you know how we see IIoT. I think the key points here are that it's not as simple as acquiring data. It's not as simple as interpreting data. It's not as simple as prescribing action. Getting the action done is often the most difficult part of this. So having the skills, having this, the, the communication skills, the ability to facilitate that action, to understand the circumstance that the people at the plant are in, in order to properly prescribe actions to them and help them get them done, that's a huge part of what we do. Um, and so, you know, technology is certainly necessary. Uh, IIoT is necessary, but it's not sufficient to generate the value in this process. So we're about getting the whole value circle completed. And that's, uh, that's basically where we're headed with the product. Very interesting presentation. Um, questions from the floor? Bob, this is Scott Affelt again. Just yeah. a, more of a comment than than a question is uh, is, is certainly this is a, this is a bold approach and um, and I think using the the data and the information to take this beyond just identifying problems is really where I think the value is created. And so I was encouraged to hear that the performance assurance, as, as uh, Stuart pointed out, is, is really focused on not just stopping it at telling these plants to have a problem, but trying to provide some insights into the cause and, uh, and provide some action and then take that one step further, help them actually implement those actions. <clears throat> Um, there's a lot of you know analytical tools that can be used to uh, to, to to identify problems, and, and that's something that's an enabling technology more than anything. And and we're, you know I know part of the subject of this conversation is the subject matter experts, and and we can automate some of that to to a large extent uh, to try to limit the bottlenecks of having limited subject matter experts. But there's still this gap where once you have a problem identified, once you think you know the problem, there's a certain uh, element of this ultra subject matter expert that really needs to provide that high level of insight either into what the problem really is or what needs to be done next. And, uh, and so that's where I see there's a real uh, uh, the gap right now. Yeah, I, I think there's yeah. an inner, go ahead. I was just going to say this is Stuart. I, I, I think that there's a technical side of this that is, you know, how to interpret the data efficiently. And, and a lot of what Peter's content addressed is, you know, using machine intelligence, you know, software algorithms to identify opportunities in, in, his, in his examples, mostly boilers. But to your point, Scott, there's a very significant human element to this that I think is is really overlooked in the whole the whole discussion. And the human element is in understanding the circumstances at the plant, in which these folks have had their, you know, their the, the staff has been cut back by 30 percent in the last year and a half. The people who are there are new. Many of them are new. They don't fully understand what they're working with. And they have a series of fires that they're trying to put out. So, you know, the technology of identifying these issues, and I'm, I'm, we're, we're agreeing, I just wanted to say that there's a skill set here that is missing, and that is the, 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 the understanding of communication with these people, appreciating their circumstances, empathizing with their circumstances, and understanding what it is that they can do tomorrow. So if we identify an opportunity to improve efficiency, um, if they're dealing with uh, a forced outage that that's not, you know, or just coming out of a forced outage, then it's often not 
practical to expect them to do something to improve reliability or efficiency this week. And there's no sense even bringing it into their consciousness in some ways until you until they are prepared and ready to move forward with that action. So I think that, again, the technology is important, but an understanding and appreciation for the day-to-day -day challenges that these plant personnel are facing is absolutely critical to realizing the value of the technology. I think that uh, one question I'd like to pose here or, or get some thoughts is, you know, you're, you're way up here as this process uh, SMUE. And so you're making, you know, a number of decisions are involved in things like, say, the Fujikin valve sticking uh, problem. And now you're moving on and you're going to be doing, you know, natural gas fired boilers and uh, hersigs and a lot of these other things. And you have a unique ability to take uh, intelligence and act on it. But if you were further empowered and that Fujikin, Crane, Samson, and others are have a, a, a slurry valve um, decision system and user group, and they come up with ways that instead of just having to wash the Fujikin valve on whatever schedule was discussed there, that either that schedule is lengthened or you've got a new valve that isn't going to cause those problems, then if you had to have access to that kind of insight as well, then you're going to be able to uh, improve these systems. Uh, uh, and and you, you're not going to have to rely on having this expertise yourselves. And it allows you as the, in this process uh, role to go on and handle other processes as well and not just, just dry scrubbers. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, I think it is. Um, this is Stuart again. I, I think that you know, bring, bringing together all of the expertise, whether it's in you know valve uh, valve cycling operation, um, is always better. Uh, uh, Stuart, are, did you want to continue there? I... Yeah, sure. I, I, I was just basically agreeing. The, the question is, how do you bring all that expertise to bear uh -huh. uh, at a facility that is, you, you know, struggling to keep the unit operating? <laughs> mm -hmm. right. like how do you how do you efficiently now, bring that knowledge into the into the into play on a day to day basis? And I think the answer is still un un uncertain, except that. Yeah. If right. the long. knowledge, there is a problem. I have looked at this, and I don't really see a whole well, lot I guess long. We got, yeah, somebody so has probably got a phone on that they don't mm -hmm. want to have us listening to. Yeah, um, but you know, go ahead, continue, uh, Zort. Well, I'm just saying that, you know, the, the, the challenge here is bringing that expertise to bear. Uh, getting the data out of the facility and getting it into the hands of the people who understand it and who can interpret it quickly and, and, you know, time is of the essence in this process. You know, it's no good to look at a valve that was stuck a month ago. Um, we, you need to get it understood now as soon as possible. And you, we need to be able to get those people who have solved that problem in the past into the, into the discussion immediately. Mm -hmm. And I think right. that's kind of what Primex is trying to do, which is to essentially get our arms around those, that expertise um, and apply it to the data position that we already have. Um, so that's that's definitely important. And it, it does drive down to things like, you know, look, it, the reason why this system is, you know, is costing $800,000 more per year to operate than it should is because there's a valve that's sticking. <laughs> right, right. And it often does get down to something as simple as that. So I think that if you're benefiting from a valve slurry decision group that's concerned about valve sticking problems in a number of story applications, that's beneficial. But let me take another example here. Uh, Ivonic has a P84 fiber, and their research is showing that um, when that's part of a laminate, that you uh, can get possibly better SO2 removal for various different reasons uh, than you otherwise would and which makes uh, pulse jet filters uh, with this media 
more attractive for the uh, spray dryer type application. But if there is a hot gas filter media discussion group that can be feeding information to you, and there's a fabric filter user group that's looking at ways to improve pulse jet and reverse air, then you as a, a process uh, uh, expert on spray dryers can then better apply that information and improve the operations. Uh, but, you know, having that organized input uh, from these various different uh, uh, focus groups would seem to be a, a, a very important. It is, and I think, you know, we're, we're anxious to bring as much expertise to bear as possible. I will say that one of, the, one of the challenges is the data itself. I mean, if you look at, this is a long pipeline, right? right. <laughs> at the front end of it, we've got data in, and at the other end of it, we've got value out. Um, what we're talking about is some of the things that happen in between. Um, I will say that, you know, getting access to the data itself, just that simple, what sounds like a simple and straightforward, uh, ch you know, piece of it is is anything but that. And having folks like Ivonic and Fujikin and everybody else get involved in seeing the data, that is going to be a challenge because the data itself needs to be secure. It can take months, if not years, to get permission to access that data. Um, and then, you know, how do you how do you, how do we interpret that data and share it in ways with uh, a broad and fragmented vendor community to bring that expertise to bear. I don't think that question's been fully answered. Yeah, that's a, that is a very good uh, uh, question because that's a challenge. As uh, you know, but it's a challenge for IIoT in general. And all of a sudden, uh, you've got millions of continuous uh, total cost of ownership analyses for every component in the plant uh, or, or plants that. Um, you know what will the what will the plant what limits will the plants themselves have on that information being made available and and uh, and how is it going to be made available and so forth? So that's a, you you raised a very good point. Any other thoughts that people have before we wind up uh, here today? If not, I'd like to thank our presenters and thank the participants and. We will um, look forward to having you participate with us in the uh, regular webinars that we're uh, running in the future. And I look uh, forward to talking to you personally at, at some of these uh, uh, conferences. So uh, again, thanks a lot. And this is Bob McElvain signing off for today. <laughs>